Good morning. Uh, the bad news is I don't think I'm going to tell you anything um, that you don't already know. Um, I see some very familiar faces in the audience, so um, I know that's true. The good news is I'm only allowed to talk for five minutes. Um, uh, it, it might be about seven, but I'll, I'll uh, try to make it uh, short. Um, and when I was thinking about this, I was supposed to talk about racial disparities in the criminal justice system, and I started to jot down a bunch of statistics uh, and, and from work that the ACLU and many others have done, um, and uh, showing that there are widespread disparities uh, and there's a differential treatment of people who are similarly situated uh, by race. Um, and, and I started to jot down statistics from stops and searches uh, from arrests from b to, to bail decisions to charging decisions to why disparities in sentencing to the administration of the death penalty to how we treat uh, kids in schools and juvenile offenders. And then I realized that my list was about 20 pages long and it was going to take me about 30 minutes to 60 minutes just to summarize how widespread those disparities are and all the places they exist. Um, so I decided not to do that um, because there are people up here who will talk about that in some detail. It's actually in our materials and I think some of you know that, but suffice it to say that racial disparities and differential treatment exists uh, throughout uh, every segment of the criminal justice system. Um, and instead of talking about that, and in fact, instead of talking about data and technology per se, although I'm very interested in how that relates to the criminal justice system, and it's why I'm here, I wanted to talk about something different, and, and I couldn't think of another way to say it, but call it something maybe culture and the need for culture change. And what I am interested in is how we can use data and analytics and big data to get at culture change. And I thought I'd reference um, Ferguson, uh, which of course we all know very well, and specifically the DOJ report in Ferguson that they did after the Michael Brown killing, looking at the police and the court system in Ferguson. Um, what they found on the one hand wasn't very surprising, at least to me. They found rampant unconstitutional policing, widespread violations of the Fourth Amendment. They found disparate treatment by race in the court system. Um, blacks were more likely to get arrested, more likely to be searched, less likely to have their case dismissed, and corrupt incentives where the city was using um, arrests to generate revenue off the backs of poor people. But what the report also concluded was something that I hadn't expected, even though I don't consider myself particularly naive. And that was a bunch of emails that court staff were sending to each other, police and people in the court system. And those frankly stunned me. And I'm gonna read a couple of those emails. Uh, one said that, uh, this was in uh, 2008, that Barack Obama wouldn't be president for very long because what black man holds a steady job for four years? Another email, and this is on work email, these, these, this is not in, in the privacy of one's home. Another depicted uh, President Obama as a chimpanzee. Uh, another told the following joke, an African-American woman in New Orleans was admitted into a hospital for a pregnancy termination. Two weeks later, she received a check for $5,000. She phoned the hospital to ask who it was from, and the hospital said, Crime Stoppers. Now, uh, the DOJ investigation not only revealed a series of these emails, and there are more, but they found that nobody was ever disciplined for exchanging these emails uh, on work email. Nobody ever said, please don't send me that email, or this is inappropriate. Um, in fact, what they tended to do was forward it to other people. And so when we talk about disparities and we talk about using data to show disparities, there's something that undergirds those disparities, and that's basically racism. Uh, and that was demonstrated in Ferguson, and Ferguson is not an anomaly. Ferguson does not exist outside the United States. It is the United States. Um, and similarly, our criminal justice system does not exist outside of Ferguson. It's an extension of Ferguson. And the attitudes and bias of places like Ferguson is, um, it undergirds the criminal justice system. It's also our criminal justice system, an important uh, extension of our legacy, a legacy that goes, as many of us know, from slavery to forced labor to Jim Crow to mass incarceration. There's a lot of talk about implicit bias, about unintended effects, but in fact, all of those things, including our criminal justice system, in most ways were not unintended and they weren't implicit. Recently, I read a book uh, called Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman. 
about the re-enslavement of black Americans after, Civil War, after the Civil War through World War II, and it starts like this, briefly. On March 30th, 1908, Green Cottingham was arrested by the sheriff of Shelby County, Alabama, and charged with vagrancy. Cottingham had committed no true crime. Vagrancy, the offense of a person not being able to prove at a given moment that he or she is employed, was a new and flimsy concoction dredged up from legal authority obscurity at the end of the 19th century by the state legislatures of Alabama and other southern states. It was capriciously enforced by local sheriffs and constables, adjudicated by mayors and notaries public, recorded haphazardly or not at all in court records, and most tellingly in a time of mass unemployment among all Southern men was reserved almost exclusively for black men. Cottenham's offense was blackness. And when I read this, I thought, of a marijuana arrest report that the ACLU put out a couple years ago that despite comparable usage rates, blacks are four times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, six, eight times as likely in some places. I also thought about my time as a public defender, and I know there's some other public defenders here in the South Bronx. I thought about an old black woman that I represented who had only a few of her teeth, suffering from stomach cancer, who was arrested outside of a bank asking for money. I thought about a kid, a teenager, a black kid, who spent a day in jail, 24 hours, for using his student metro card on election day, which is not allowed. And I thought about a 47-year-old black woman with no criminal record who was on a subway car and made uncomfortable by another man on the car. So she switched cars while the train was moving. She got arrested, spent 24 hours in jail, and missed a day of work. The selective enforcement of our criminal laws is nothing new and stems in many respects from racial bias. I'm going to conclude. So on the one hand, I think it's important to understand that the unprecedented increase in our prison population, in the broader carceral state, and the number of people with criminal records was not inevitable, is not simply a result of crime rates. It was, arose from deliberate legal and policy choices by the left and by the right in response to politics. And we can use data to dismantle them. But I think it's also important to realize that the attendant racial disparities in our criminal justice system are not just a result of those policies, but arise from a cultural and historical fabric whereby those choices have often been saturated with and sometimes driven by racial bias and racial animus. And I'm interested to see how we can use the increased attention to criminal justice, the increased access to data to change that culture in addition to changing policies. Thank you. Thank you.